Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers around the world. Welcome to the ISDP Taiwan Nordic Forum 2023. My name is Jing Bo Jun. I'm a research fellow at the Asia Program in Stockholm China Center at ISDP. Uh, thank you all for tuning in today. We are very delighted to host this panel on digital diplomacy, which is the second session of this year's Taiwan Nordic Forum. The forum is part of our Taiwan Studies project, and we hope that this event will provide a platform for valuable discussion regarding Nordic-Taiwan relations. Today, it is our great pleasure to have two distinguished experts on the subject, Ms. Guo Jiayou and Dr. Zhuja Anna Ferenzi. Both are currently based in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, our first uh, panelist, uh, Jiayou, is the founder of the Taiwan Digital Diplomacy Association, which is a strategic marketing organization that bridges Taiwan and other countries through social media and data analysis. Over the past five years, Jayo has worked with diverse groups of people across the globe, uh, including Hungarian Roma, Greek uh, refugees, Kosovo National Museum, Taiwanese startup centers, and Vietnamese medical institutions. Her work has been recognized by more than 100 international media sources and has participated in um, notable productions by HBO and BBC. She's also a member of the International Affairs Committee of the Taiwan Network and Information Center and the board of Radio Taiwan International. Welcome to the forum, Jiayo. And thank you. Our, thank you. Our welcome. second, thank you. Uh, our second panelist, uh, Dr. Zhuja Anna Ferenzi, is an Associated Research Fellow at ISDP and an Affiliated Scholar at the Department of Political Science of the Free University of Brussels, VUB. Um, additionally, she serves as the uh, head of the Associate Network at Nidash Line, a prominent platform that provides original commentary and analysis on issues affecting the Indo-Pacific area. Shuja is also a research fellow at Taiwan Next Gen Foundation and an expert consultant on China, Taiwan, and the Korean Peninsula for Human Rights Without Frontiers. Currently, she conducts research as a Taiwan fellow hosted by the Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan and serves as an assistant professor at the National Donghua University in Hualien. It is great to have you again at the forum, Shuja. In terms of the, yeah, thank you. Uh, in terms of the logistics for this webinar, uh, Jayo and Zhuja will each speak for approximately 12 to 15 minutes. Following their presentations, we will have around 25 to 30 minutes for a Q&A session. And we welcome questions at any point during the webinar. Uh, please just use the Q&A chat function to post your uh, questions and include your affiliation. Without further ado, let's get started. And Jiayou, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Bo Jing. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jiayou from Taiwan Digital Diplomacy Association. Uh, let me share my slides first. Um, yeah, um, today I'm going to share about our experience on how digital tools can um, and help us to raise the awareness of people about human rights issues and how to promote the partnership image of, uh, of your own country with other countries. Um, because Taiwan Digital Diplomacy Association is our, our regular work. We are always uh, working on how to increase um, the exposures of Taiwan on international media or foreign social media through engaging in different foreign societies topics. Um, yeah, because today we only have 10 minutes to 15 minutes, right? So uh, I will not spend too much time on uh, introductions of myself, but um, but currently uh, in Taiwan, a lot of government uh, institutions, they are working on uh, connecting with uh, foreign media as well. So uh, I'm usually working with, in the community with those government institutions, and also uh, we are helping other nonprofit organizations to to uh, to plan or to make the strategy about how to connect themselves with the foreign organization as well. And today's uh, we are going to talk about the concept of um, national branding 
national branding, I think, is um, uh, is a is an old old concept. But in today's era, we have a different uh, interpretation of it because we have more digital platforms and we have more media channels than before. Um, when we talk about uh, national branding, we uh, the purpose of uh, building the national branding is to make our country more attractive, right? Um, now, I would like to invite all of you to think about one country in your mind. This country might be uh, the country you always want to go study, studying, or maybe you want to work in this country. Um, everyone ready? <laughs> maybe 10 seconds for everyone to think about one country. Yeah, I believe everyone has one or maybe two countries in your mind. And, uh, and then I would like to invite you to think about what is the reason that you want to go to visit, visit this country or you want to stay in this country so much. Maybe, uh, maybe you got some information on the media. You have had a lot of positive image from media channels or maybe you have a friend in this country or maybe uh, you love the products from this country or maybe just you believe in the same values with people from this country. So there are many reasons that you can like a country or you can see a country attractive and this kind of reasons or elements are the uh, other other things that we are working on to promote our country image and um, I also like to share that the core concept of digital diplomacy is how to build trust how to build trust within uh, people from different countries because with trust we can do a lot of a lot of things together like you maybe you would tend to buy the product from this country more or maybe you would like to be friend from this country or maybe you would like to invest in this country we got a lot of benefits if you uh, if you have more trust to this country and our uh, our goal is to um, to make um, uh, to building the trust is to make a, a common prosperity together and to uh, to make the environment more stable and better for each other's political and economical uh, development. So there are many benefits there. I cannot finish <laughs> in one slide, but um, here are some points that you can uh, can give you the reference. And um, for for today's, um, I would like to share three simple concepts about how to build trust with other uh, foreign communities through. 3C. Uh, the first one is community. Um, the first thing is community. That um, the concept of digital diplomacy is not only about the the national border because internet has no border. So uh, I think the concept of community sometimes is higher than uh, nationality on internet. Um, with community, we have to find because uh, people on the internet, we will gather together who share the same value or who uh, who have the same goal or have the same interest. They will gather together and we call it a community. So on um, internet, we have to find uh, the community who is uh, sharing the same values with us. So uh, here I have one example of, um, um, of, uh, of Milk Tea Alliance. Uh, Milk Tea Alliance, it was... Um, Milk Tea Alliance, it was uh, uh, Mimi War before. <laughs> uh, it was very popular with seeing, it was very popular with seeing Southeastern Asian younger generation um, in 2020. And back to 2020, um, it was originally a Mimi War between Thai, Thai people and Chinese people. Uh, but after all, it turns out it become a dem democracy, a democracy uh, alliance for against to China authoritarian. So, um, like um, this Milk Tea Alliance, um, we created like uh, our association also created a lot of uh, memes for supporting this concept, and also we create a new Milk Tea Alliance between. Taiwan and India, because back to the time, China was also having a border conflict with the, with, against the Chinese government. So uh, we created this uh, India Milk Tea Alliance, and also we produced uh, some Milk Tea Alliance Mimi to support Thai, Thailand, and also India, and also Hong Kong people. And, and uh, surprisingly, uh, we found 
our picture was using in a protest of Thai students' movement against the um, Thailand government because Milk Tea Alliance kind of became a symbol of um, diplomat dem democratic allies against the authoritarian. So um, this hashtag and also the meme we use are using, uh, we, we can see what it is used not only online, but also offline, influence people offline as well. Uh, it was used by Thai students and it was also printed out by India people and India magazine also used our, our memes to um, talk about the relation between Taiwan, India and China. So uh, meme is not only meme, sometimes it can really influence people's uh, people's mindset or people's concept about community. And uh, the second C I would like to share is about uh, creativity because, um, because now we are always saying that maybe uh, some authoritarian government, they have more budget for promoting themselves on the internet. How can we how to can we fight against to this kind of propaganda? I think creativity might be the solution for it because uh, with creativity, um, I mean, if you have a content, a more creative content, um, sometimes it have better effects than um, than chat GPT or than uh, just government propaganda. Um, people always looking for people are always looking for something funny, something interesting, and something they want to share. So if you can produce some. Uh, content that people really want to share that you don't really have to uh, worry about uh, the budget different because I uh, for example uh, for example last year last year um, Chinese government they have a lot of propaganda toward uh, Honduran Honduran people Honduras is one of Taiwan diplomatic allies is one of our diplomatic allies and um, and this um, this this um, it, it, there was a situ emergent situation that Honduras, they were saying about they want to break the diplomatic ties with Taiwan. So we created this Mimi. Uh, is Mimi again? Yeah, we put um, Honduran president and the vice president of US, uh, Ms. Harris, and also uh, the vice president of Taiwan, William Lai. We put them together and uh, they were sharing a street food, a kind of street food from Honduras. It's called belly ads. Um, when they are sharing the belly ads, they are sharing the street food and they are saying that. Oh, the best three, the best belly ads should be shared with best friends. So it is uh, conveying the message that um, Honduras, U.S., and Taiwan should be friends together. It's kind of political. It's kind of a political cartoon, but we are uh, using uh, belly ads as our, uh, as our uh, like. We we try to make it more uh, closer to people's uh, like daily life, and. On the other side, this one, um, it was uh, Mimi was also popular in Ukraine social media. Uh, before there was uh, uh, Mimi, they were talking about living next to Russia, um, caused different types of headaches. And we changed the Thai, the, the tax into living next to China is also causing people's head, headaches as well. And it got around 225,000 shares, likes um, on Twitter, because people think it is something funny um, and something they kind of agree with. So um, our, our daily job, usually we, we stay on Twitter and find some um, interesting political cartoon or we produce meme and try to engage with local discussion. And the third C I would like to share about is about uh, credibility. And because sometimes if you see the resource on um, internet, maybe you would questions like what who are who are the producer like who provide this information or who are the organization who provide this um, this meme or uh, video. So uh, whenever there is some delegation group come to Taiwan, uh, we will always invite our uh, officials like Audrey Tom, he's our digital minister, or sometimes we will invite our ambassadors or uh, representative foreign representatives to record some videos with us and to share uh, the democracy values of Taiwan and what are the common value we we share with other country. It depends on which delegation group come to Taiwan. Like this one is for, is for Czech delegation. It's for Czech delegation group. Like we invited, uh, we invited Czech uh, politician to record one video, and uh, we also invited our digital minister to record another video to uh, correspond to each other's um, internet. 
And um, this one, um, yeah, so if we want to, uh, if you want to create community with creativity and credibility, we always in encourage our volunteer to be like a diplomat. Um, and here are some personality I would just briefly show, show to you guys. Um, and I, I would like to sh spend the, the, the other part of my uh, speaking time here. Um, for, for more concrete stories, I would like to share another story about um, there is a campaign is called My Name, My Right in Taiwan and Norway. Um, in, 2000, in 2017, uh, there was a Taiwanese lawyer. He He's my friend and his name is Joseph and he was studying in Norway. And uh, he found this, um, he, he found a situation quite uh, um, interesting that um, the resident permit of Taiwanese in Norway, our nationality would be changed into China. And the lawyer, Joseph, he considered it as a human right violation because um, Norwegian government didn't um, seek for the uh, agreement or didn't ask for the opinion from Taiwanese. So he decided to put it into um, into the court, it put this case into court because he said, um, if we don't make it a lawful uh, problem, no one would really pay attention to it. So um, he launched this campaign, My Name, My Right, and uh, he wanted to spread uh, the information about, about his doing this law case in Europe and also in Norway. Um, he, he has contacted many lawyers and um, media people. Um, also, we were helping him to connect with um, Taiwanese students who are studying in Europe um, at the same time. And uh, we use this campaign, My Name, My Right. Uh, we use this hashtag and we invited people from different uh, student groups to participate in our video recording. And uh, this case, uh, the My Name, My Right, the, the lawsuit case, was, uh, it was put into European Human Rights Court in 2000, in 2020, but it was denied. Um, it was um, it, it was it was totally a result that we 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 know it will happen because um, it is a is it a suitcase? I mean, it is a low um, suit. It will never win. We know the result will be like this, but we still want to fight for our right because uh, we have to. Um, if we are doing the if we are doing the project while we are doing the project we got the time to promote our position in europe to europe european media and also to norwegian government we want to um, speak our voice so um not only we not only um, record the video with european uh, student group we also um, have some online speech to um, american um, politicians like to clearly then about the position of Taiwanese, like our nationality should be Taiwan, Republic of China, not 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 PRC. So uh, we are using the digital tool during pandemic time also because this case was um, it was kind of long from 2017 to 2020, and um, we we try to um, keep our voice during the pandemic time also. And when we look at I always not only overseas Taiwanese, but when we look at overseas Ukrainian, you can see that they are also using digital tools to helping their own country. Like they were um, doing advertisement overseas or they are using crowdfunding platform. Um, there are a group of Euro Ukrainian girls, Ukrainian women, they were raising fans in Taiwan and they got 1.8 million um, Taiwanese dollars within two months um, and uh, to help the women um, to support themselves in Ukraine. and. Um, yeah, so we see the uh, we see the power of digital tools. Not only can hope uh, you can not only help with your uh, domestic um, social topics, it can also it can also help you uh, from overseas. So, like this year, we are providing a training for uh, for overseas Taiwanese for cyber um, cyber defense, cyber warfare. We were. Um, we were providing training. We are providing training for Taiwanese about how to produce the content for, um, uh, like promote the like how to produce the content to connect Taiwan with other uh, communities, with foreign communities regarding to cyber warfare or how can we react if there is, um, if the 
if the war between Taiwan and China really happened, what can we do? How do we contact uh, foreign media or foreign politicians? We are having this kind of training. So yeah, I guess the time's up. So if you are interested in our work, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. And also, uh, yeah, on Twitter, we, it is a totally English platform. And um, we were happy to, uh, to provide any kind of information for digital diplomacy and also um, connecting Taiwanese organization with with um, all the organization around the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jayo, uh, for your very, very informative and insightful uh, presentation. And also, by the way, great control of pace and time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you. Yeah, so um, now, now let's um, turn to uh, Dr. Shuja, uh, the microphone is now open to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Bo Jun, and thank you for uh, having us today. Thanks to ISDP for um, putting this issue on the agenda, and I'm happy uh, to join Jayo also um, to discuss uh, digital diplomacy. So my presentation will be quite different. Um, also, um, let, let me just uh, share my screen. So what I would like to do is to, in a way, I mean, clearly and hopefully it will um, complement the previous presentation, but what I would like to do is to look at the geopolitics of digital diplomacy, in particular, the European Union's digital diplomacy and to look at EU-Taiwan cooperation in this context. So, um, the outline, what I will do in the next 10, 15 minutes is first to talk about uh, the content, a little bit of the content of uh, digital diplomacy and to place this in a geopolitical context. And then to speak of role of the role of digital diplomacy in EU Taiwan ties. So if we discuss the content of digital diplomacy, I think it's useful to first just uh, mention public diplomacy in the European context, because it is a process that allows projecting influence and it allows the EU to shape international norms, to engage with the world over the long term, to build trust. And this is actually an element that uh, we already heard of, but it's a crucial element. And, it will be coming back in my presentation a few times, and also to help a mutual understanding and to facilitate cooperation to tackle global challenges. So this is more of a conventional public diplomacy that the EU engages with. So in so the question is that how effective is this process? How effectively can the EU project itself? Similar questions are relevant, obviously, in the case of Taiwan. What is the effectiveness and how do we measure that? I think that's where the, the challenge is. And how can the EU maintain its global relevance? So that takes us to the geopolitical dimension. The geopolitical EU as a concept, as we know, was put forward a few years back in order to address um, the, the challenge that the EU is facing in terms of perhaps weakening uh, global relevance uh, in the face of a growing geostrategic competition, weakening multilateralism, and most recently, uh, obviously, the uh, Russia's war against Ukraine, and also the EU, I'm sorry, also the Russia-China rhetorical alignment uh, has increased the sense of urgency in the EU to seek to become a geopolitical technology actor able to deploy digital diplomacy by working with partners. So you see, again, I'm using partners and trust, and these will be coming back uh, in the next slide. So just like with public diplomacy, obviously, digital diplomacy re needs instruments. Jayo also spoke to us about the instruments that they use uh, to help uh, Taiwan's profile, but it also needs that awareness um, and that vision and in the European in, or in the EU context, clearly, it requires a common strategy among 27 countries and their people, and it needs the resources and the structure to deploy those instruments. So the question is, just like with public diplomacy, is how effective is the EU in using digital means to pursue its foreign policy? So in this context, I think it's also important to speak of the EU's strategic autonomy or the ambition to achieve strategic strategic autonomy, um, because this clearly stands for the capacity 
to decide for itself, for the EU not to have to choose sides in the US-China rivalry. And this is how I'm connecting digital diplomacy to the geopolitical context, um, which also stands for, or also has a dimension in the digital uh, dimension, uh, the digital sovereignty. Uh, to increase resilience and ensure competitiveness. So, of course, we only have an hour for this discussion today. So I am really just scratching the surface on some of the initiatives, but I would here mention the 2021 EU Digital Compass that is was put out to secure the digital sovereignty. And then, of course, in contrast with that, speaking of challenges and speaking of geostrategic competition and weakening multilateralism, we also have the concept of techno-authoritarianism, which seeks to use digital technologies in order to increase regime control, so political control over public debate and to restrict opposition. Um, since 2016, again, speaking of the EU's public diplomacy and digital diplomacy, these concepts have been strategic priorities of the foreign security policy of the EU. So clearly there is a, an existing link between uh, how the EU acts domestically and how it projects itself uh, onto the global stage and how it fights against challenges that try to undermine that. So disinformation, hybrid threats, foreign information manipulation and interference. The latest, I believe, um, conclusions from the EU came out in 2022 on EU digital diplomacy, where member states, they all called for a comprehensive approach so that um, all EU institutions work together to have an ambitious EU external digital policy. Uh, one of the countries pushing most, uh, among others, were also Denmark. Uh, in order to have a strong mandate and involve uh, the different institutions and have consistency. Um, now, time again is short, so I don't want to go through this list. It also might be boring, but I think it's interesting to just mention a few of the goals of digital diplomacy in this context. Uh, it is about projecting the EU on the global stage. And again, it's interesting because we're speaking of the EU as an international um, institution, I mean, international um, organization of 27 countries, and Jayo spoke of Taiwan's efforts to project itself and also to, um, to increase its profile. So it is on the global stage, uh, but it also means from the European perspective to really shape and be able to shape standards. And I think that's very important, a very important element of digital diplomacy from the European perspective, because in this digital age, clearly whoever shapes standards uh, will be more in the position to really shape the narrative. And also the idea is to have a human-centric, human rights-based approach. Um, lack of consistency and coherence have been an issue. And also this gap between how the EU sees itself on the global stage and how the EU is being perceived by others uh, internationally. So I spoke of digital diplomacy, but there's so many uh, aspects of life that actually have a digital uh, dimension. Speaking of digital transition in the European context, that is also a political priority in the, in the economy, um, which also has an internal and external dimension. So if we look at how the EU is trying to use this digital diplomacy externally, I think this is a good time to mention the Global Gateway, which was put out recently in order to link digital development investments from the EU in lower income countries with values-based digital regulation. Again, you see that the idea of um, shaping standards and shaping regulation is, is uh, very much at the heart of, of the EU's digital diplomacy. So to shape how countries approach the idea, and also I think this is a stage where we're at in the European debate, that there is a shift in how the EU approaches foreign and develop, development policy at the same time, integrating a wide range of economic tools into the foreign uh, field. So I spoke mostly of positive dimensions of course all of this is positive as long as it allows to citizens to benefit uh, from the process of connectivity regulation digital literacy but of course there's also negative dimension which is digital disinformation digital repression so this is perhaps a good time now to switch to speaking of partnerships and um, to see how the eu uses digital diplomacy 
in its relationship with Taiwan in the context of the Indo-Pacific, being mindful that the Indo-Pacific is a region that is very vulnerable, exposed to authoritarian advance, to coercion, to the weaponization of trade and information. So stressing the importance of partnerships, uh, the EU has been pushing for bilateral regional partnerships in this uh, field of digital diplomacy um, with like-minded partners, again, based on trust in order to set standards together and to shape digital regulation. So here, quickly to mention that we have an EU-US Trade and Technology Council, also one with India. And then the EU has digital partnership with Japan, with South Korea, but also with Singapore. And that digital trade rules are being also negotiated in FTAs with Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, and uh, India. Um, Switching on from the idea of partnership and the importance of partnership to um, the, the field of the internet and how there are challenges enabled by digital, the digital uh, development in the field of um, connectivity. Um, in April last year, there was a declaration for the future of the internet, which Taiwan, uh, as far as I know, also joined uh, last year, which already was endorsed by um, 70 partners. And of course the idea is, and oops, this uh, is not new information to you, that a trusted internet stands for open, free, global, interoperable, reliable, and secure, and also the, the protection of human rights online and across the digital world. Uh, in the European context, we also have the Digital for Development Hub, which also looks at ways to um, have a digital development along these lines, uh, which uh, was um, put forward by 12 member states, including Sweden and Finland, uh, which also has a Team Europe approach. This is a concept that um, we, you all might have already come across in the context of um, fighting global challenges, meaning that it is a comprehensive approach on the European level that brings together the member states, the institutions, also the private sector. And I think clearly this signals uh, an inclusive approach. And if we switch to Taiwan, that is something that in particular, um, Digital Minister Audrey Tang has often spoken of that in Taiwan's experience, of going digital and also uh, the digital development is to really ensure a, um, an inclusive approach. And I think this, this co-creation idea is also about being inclusive towards citizens and having this two-way trust between the government and citizens. And so this PPPP uh, concept that stands for people, public, private partnerships really speaks for itself, I guess, um, that it is to bridge um, all stakeholders in, in order to ensure um, an inclusive approach. Uh, and there are different um, initiatives that Taiwan's government has put forward in addition to in a way, uh, in a way to complement the previous presentation to speak a little bit about what the government has put out. Uh, I would mention here the uh, DG Plus in 2016 that stands for Digital Nation and Innovative Economic Development. Um, that was, I believe, put forward by the executive or the legislative UN, sorry. So in this contact, uh, context, um, aware that Taiwan has its own strengths in terms of transparency and ensuring transparency uh, an open government. I think what is most important in the EU-Taiwan context is to recognize and to understand each other's strengths in this regard. And um, also another strength that Taiwan has is clearly in the fight against disinformation, which has become an issue increasingly relevant or most relevant when it comes to the EU's geopolitical ambitions also in the context or in light of um, Russian, the Russian aggression. So in this, at this stage where we have a momentum in EU-Taiwan bilateral relations, I think if uh, we go forward in the sense of understanding each other's strengths and bringing that closer 
um, in the, to the conversation, such as the Taiwan EU dialogue on digital economy, which has been happening uh, since 2019, that touches upon these uh, concepts. Um, I believe that the two-way trust is uh, something that European countries have much to learn from, from Taiwan in terms of the transparency, technology, and trust. So um, I would like to just finish because I think I'm, I'm out of time here, but I would just like to broaden the debate or, or the angle a little bit even further beyond the EU and Taiwan because I spoke of the Indo-Pacific and also um, on the challenges and like-minded partnerships. And clearly now we know that the G20, um, India is uh, presiding over the G20 and there's also a, a clear agenda on um, digital economy and development. So I think uh, going forward, the bilateral relationship between the EU and Taiwan has a lot of potential in, in learning from each other. And I think this is something that has to also go forward in minilateral co cooperation, given Taiwan's uh, risk, um, constraints diplomatically. So um, I, I will stop here because I want to leave more time for questions. And um, over to you, Bojun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susha. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. And uh, thank you for putting in uh, this topic into the context of uh, EU-Taiwan relations. So, um, and I am sure that uh, both of your presentations have uh, provoked some, uh, some thoughts and some um, questions on, on, the, on this matter. And uh, we actually got uh, several questions already. So I was, as a moderator, I mean, I, I'm gonna skip my question now. Go, go straight to the uh, question from the audience. Um, okay, um, um, I have a colleague from ISDP August. Uh, he asked, uh, are there any possible challenges or constraints for digital diplomacy uh, in working within current social media infrastructure? I guess this question's for uh, both of you. Maybe, um, Jayo, you could, Go first. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Okay. sorry. The, yeah, the question is about the um, the challenges, uh, right? challenges, and yeah, challenges and constraints <laughs> for uh, for digital diplomacy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the the most obvious uh, challenges might be the uh, the transparency of uh, the internet. I mean, transparent rate. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to a country, they don't use social media at all. It's very hard for us to promote any campaign or any um, topics in in those countries. And I think the, the second one might be um, sometimes when we want to find uh, uh, a topic that is um, they can attract majority's uh, attention, we have to find the common value between uh, maybe between Taiwan and local society or between uh, different communities in local uh, in local society, we have to do a lot of research, and sometimes the research costs might cost two, three weeks, and even a month. And when we when we decided the topic, maybe sometimes the 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 topic has has filled away. I mean, it if it, it, it faded already. So so um, I think the uh, the challenge lies in like like how can we get the right timing to cut in cut into the social media I mean of the local society so uh, yeah so I think the the importance or the uh, the core of doing digital diplomacy might be you have to really be observant and be um, you have to adapt to different culture very quickly that you can uh, find the right topics to communicate with your audience online. Yeah. Thank you, Jayo. Uh, Suja, you have anything to add? I think Jayo really. Um, tackled the question, I, I agree, transparency is a challenge and also being mindful of the local uh, context in which uh, digital diplomacy is to be deployed. I think that's that's a very important uh, point, but I don't think I, I want to uh, add much more to what Jayo said at this stage. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question related directly uh, related to digital diplomacy is from, well, this one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, to what extent uh, digital diplomacy campaigns can really affect higher level of political agenda? 
So I guess, yeah, yeah this question, yeah. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. I will to go like first. High politics, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, the original purpose of we doing Digital Diplomacy Association is that we believe that if we, if we affect um, citizens, I mean, foreign citizens, maybe someday they will influence their government also. Uh, I would like to give an example of what I have done in Kosovo. Um, uh, we have a we have a project in 2017 to 2018 in Kosovo. We were promoting um, the digital development of Taiwan and Kosovo, what we can do together. And also we can seek for the uh, online independency together because um, Kosovo, they are still struggling with their uh, domain name. Um, so we opened a fan page. We opened a fan page in Kosovo. And at first, um, it it only got maybe hundreds of likes of the fan page. But uh, when we reached out to maybe 2,000 likes of the fan page, the government, uh, the government of Kosovo, they started to contact us and they want to see uh, what are the, uh, what what is the 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 arguments or what are the topics we want to get. Uh, we want to get engaged with them. So um, I believe that if we got enough citizens to discuss about the topic, we can uh, we can engage local government into this discussion as well. And also, uh, if we got a lot of likes or a lot of discussion on media or social media, it can also influence government decision or their attitude toward the international uh, politics also. Um, for example, uh, the Honduran case I have used in my slides that we uh, we've at the end we got around five thousand likes. So uh, we contact the Honduran media to do a media coverage about the Mimi, and then we hope the um, we hope the Honduran media can also influence the attitude of Honduran government toward Taiwan, like not to break the diplomatic ties with Taiwan. We we don't know what um, what is the actual influence uh, at the end because. Uh, for digital diplomacy, is a is a very long term thing. Uh, is um, like building trust is something invisible, but you cannot say it's impossible to do it. So uh, it is um, a long term a long term construction. So uh, we have to believe that we can make small change at the first step, and then we have to we have to continue it and uh, last it for many many years, and maybe we can see the changes at the end. And uh, I will also I will also share uh, another example of um, German government last year. Uh, I remember the, I, I don't know if you guys remember that German government has uh, has they have gave um, uh, have gave some weapon to Ukraine last year, but it was at a very low level of the weapon. I, it's not a very functional weapon, uh, and a lot of a lot of people in Germany they they criticize the government decision about giving the like it's kind of like a secondhand weapon that cannot really be used in a war to Ukraine. They were criticized a lot. So the government decided to change their decision and give another um, new weapons to Ukrainian government at the end. So this is how um, sometimes uh, online discussion or internet can influence government changes decision Yeah, in, in reality. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jayo and uh, Zhuja. Do you have anything to, to add? To yes, I, I, do, I do agree with Jayo that this is a long-term process, um, and it also goes back to what I was saying earlier. How do we actually measure the effectiveness? But I think we have enough examples to see that in societies that allow an open uh, internet uh, space uh, and and space for for um, difference different opinions in that space digital diplomacy can actually lead to pressure and to change in government positions or or statements but in a con so in a democracy essentially right and we could see how in the context of the russian invasion of ukraine uh, we could see how people mobilized with just sharing information um, for the cause of protecting and supporting uh, Ukraine and also to uh, help the refugees. And, and in that regard, there was a mobilization that could happen uh, because there was space for it. But in a context that does not allow that space, uh, in an authoritarian uh, country, obviously, digital diplomacy does not uh, uh, work, uh, I would say, I mean, again, 
perhaps um, does not work in the official sense, right? Because there is a, a top-down control uh, that restricts that space. Um, and this is in the case of, of Russia, clearly uh, just using the word, the, the, the word, the word war was clearly not allowed. So those examples uh, just remind us that it depends on the space that we're talking about. So I think these two examples perhaps are good examples. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have several other questions and uh, this one from uh, Ray Juan, um, uh, my colleague at, C uh, at uh, ISDP, the this one is uh, specifically to Suja. Um, is there any? Uh, is there another good example of the EU engaging in active di digital diplomacy with other countries, or can we see it as an ad hoc uh, substitute due to the uh, EU's lack of official ties with Taiwan? Well, I mean. The digital space is one that the EU has increasingly been using in order to project itself as a geopolitical power uh, on the global stage. So it, it's, a, it's a global uh, outreach that the EU is trying to do with the digital diplomacy. And in the case of Taiwan, given um, the the lack of official diplomatic ties, but also given the fact that the EU has a framework within it cooperates with Taiwan, uh, which is its one China policy, which allows that cooperation. I think um, anything that is subnational diplomacy, parliamentary diplomacy or city diplomacy or digital diplomacy, these are all the tools that both the EU has been using vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan and Taiwan I think also has been uh, using as tools to to project itself and also to to protect its international space. So perhaps the question, the way it's framed, um, it might give the impression that it's uh, it's just an ad hoc um, tool. But in fact, I think there is a conscious um, effort to use this tool as an effective tool to allow that engagement in spite of uh, the pressure that comes from the PRC. Thank you, Susha. Uh, Jayo, do you have anything to add for this question? For the EU? No, I, I don't have much to add on. I'm, I'm checking in other questions. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, right, uh, I guess uh, I'll raise, okay, this question from uh, uh, Luanga, also colleague at uh, ISTP. Uh, what are the prospects and potential for uh, digital diplomacy to serve as a tool and avenue uh, for dialogue and negotiation in the midst of an ongoing crisis? Uh, in other words, do you think digital diplomacy can become the new shuttle diplomacy? Okay, I can answer this one. It's a very interesting question. Uh, I think uh, I think maybe you guys have noticed that uh, a lot of things has happened on Twitter. Sometimes it's before the news, uh, like uh, when international politicians they want to release some information, maybe they would make some tweets on their Twitter first before they talk to the media. And this is, uh, is I, I see also a, a part of the process, uh, a process of negotiation too, before they really move into the negotiation or before they really uh, go into a meeting room, they start to release some information on social media platform and uh, and they will see how each other react to it and they can also listen to how people react to it. And then maybe they will change their saying right away, maybe after a couple hours or maybe after a few days. So I see a uh, social media platform, it become uh, it become a new uh, a new field for uh, it's, it's a new place for for politicians, especially for international politicians, politi politics to negotiate with each other or to get information or to um, to get more feedback uh, this way. Yeah, I think it is a new role for digital diplomacy. Thank you, um, you. Suja. I agree with uh, what Jayos just said, and I think it's 
also interesting to to think of this space uh, as there's an ongoing contest to, uh, between forces that want to inhabit this space. And so I think, for example, the battle of narratives in a way that was also shaped as, um, as um, a phenomenon that describes this uh, tension between uh, entities or political uh, actors that push for, for transparency and rule of law, as opposed to those more authoritarian leaning um, actors. And this space, this digital space is, is out there. And I, I think it's very difficult, obviously, to control because it's, it's everywhere. Um, and I think um, through what Jayo just explained, I think um, what is important from perhaps, if I can say as a European for, or Europe's perspective, and I suppose this is what Taiwan also shares as a democracy with the EU, is to ensure that that space is not sabotaged or uh, taken up by, by those elements that undermine uh, democracy and transparency. But I guess that's an open challenge that, that remains for, for governments and also for civil society and associations like yours, Chayo, and also for academia and think tanks. I also want to add on, uh, according to what Susha said, that I think I think uh, social media make international politics politics more uh, more complicated because everyone is on the internet, everyone is there, and um, the, in the discussion, it, the discussion is not only between politicians; it can also be between people to people, or even people to enterprises or government to enterprises. Everyone is there. Uh, for example, um, Ukrainian government they has asked for Google or Apple or YouTube or Meta to stop the service uh, for Russia at the beginning of the war. So uh, it's, it's it's not only uh, it's not only about international politics. Sometimes it's about uh, business and all the stakeholders they can share. We can share together or we can fight against each other it's kind of um yeah more difficult mm. yeah definitely the landscape is getting more and more crowded and complicated right so uh because there are many uh stakeholders involved um yeah so um this question from Liu, um i think uh for for a uh, question for um Zhuzha, uh thanks for your wonderful sharing first and uh, he or she raised uh, two questions. The uh, first one is, may I know your opinion on the EU's normative power? In addition, how will it affect their digital diplomacy? And the second one, what are your perspectives about the future of SWIFT, the, the international payment system, <laughs> especially since in, it has been uh, utilized to wage sanctions on Russia due to the invasion in 2022? Um, I guess the first one is more, more directly related to our topic today, so you could answer that one, yeah. I would say so. <laughs> the second one is uh, goes in, in a um, quite different direction, but let me just uh, address the question on normative power. I mean, it, what I spoke of at the beginning of my presentation, speaking of public diplomacy, I mean, it is in, at the end of the day, it's all about the EU's normative power, which is to project itself on the global stage in a way that um, makes it look attractive and, and makes other countries want to embrace the value values that it represents. So um, I actually did my PhD research on the EU's normative power vis-a-vis -vis China. And clearly um, there has been um, some success in terms of projecting those, uh, those values in the areas that um, have been perceived uh, by the Chinese authorities as um, areas that are important to, um, to ensure its own development. So a selective embrace the EU's normative power is what I think that we've seen in the past decades, uh, in particular, for example, in, in uh, environmental protection, uh, because clearly that is an area that uh, is important to protect uh, the China's further economic development. But when it comes to more sensitive or political areas of, of political uh, human rights, or uh, as opposed to say economic and social human rights, uh, those areas have been um, less effective. So overall, uh, just to cut it short, I would say that the EU's normative power, soft power, is uh, relevant, but clearly we are in a different geopolitical context that requires 
hard power and requires. And I, by hard power, I don't actually mean um, military because economic power is hard power. So what I mean is for the EU to be able to learn to use the power that it has, which is economic power, its economic weight is its largest asset, to use that in a way that is strategically um, important and it allows it to be globally relevant. So um, perhaps I stop here and we take some other questions. Otherwise I could continue on this for longer. Thank you, Suja. Yeah, um, sure. Um, it's, it's your PhD uh, topic. So I guess you'll have way more lot to share. Yeah, but um, um, thank you. Um, I guess we have another question. We have another question uh, related to digital diplomacy from uh, Eileen Chu of uh, Taiwan Dip uh, Digital Diplomacy Association. Uh, the question is, what about this information while utilizing the power of digital diplomacy? How to tackle this kind of issue? Okay, uh, regarding yeah, this, the, yeah. Re regarding to this information, I think uh, most of the most of the discussion in Taiwan now is that how to detect this information, uh, and and for my I my opinion is that the next step of uh, how to fight against this information is how to produce the content to fight against this information because um, if you it is for me it's not enough only only detecting this information the more important thing is that how to um how to use the right content or how to provide more uh content to to join this propaganda war because i uh like for example china chinese chinese government they have a lot of budget to to do their propaganda and they also produce a lot of uh, fake news or disinformation to spread in taiwan also uh, and um, and what we can do now even we cannot compete with the china government's budget we still can think about how to use creative content and how to how to collaborate with um, content producer Content provider, and for me, my I strongly I strongly suggest to Taiwanese government that they would they should invest more in supporting the content provider of Taiwan. Uh, for example, um, YouTuber or maybe key opinion leaders or maybe some independent media, they should provide more support to them to encourage them to provide um, like high quality content, like not only like for for all the audience. Um, in Taiwan, maybe not only in Taiwan, in uh, everywhere, that like you have to, um, you have to cultivate the talents who can produce content, and also you have to, you have to build the channels, or you have to support the channels who provide information. This is more important for me to, um, like this is a strategy to fight against this information. So I think digital diplomacy in this way um, is can help because digital diplomacy is the. Um, providing the soft power diplomacy and also we are building uh, communication channels with foreign community also so uh, I think um, like building channel would be a big, a big topic for um, fighting this information thank you thank you thank you Jayo um, Shusha you have anything to add for this question no, I think that's a very important point that we need to fight against this information in a proactive way. So it, it does not require only a defensive approach, but also uh, an offensive one through which we put out that content that Jayo was talking about in order to protect that space, that digital space that is being used by forces that um, seek to undermine democracy. So I think uh, in the European context, there is there has been quite a lot of progress in in embracing that uh, that thought in terms of the importance of fighting disinformation. Clearly, what we see in the context of Russian uh, of the Russian invasion, this is something that Russia has been working on for years, interfering in our democratic processes. And I think the European response has not clearly been strong enough. But now um, there is a new reality and i think uh, it's also very positive to see that mm -hmm. the europeans and taiwan uh, work proactively in the field of disinformation and information manipulation um, to make that as a joint area of, of common interest that's why we we already had the 
Committee of uh, Fighting Against Disinformation from the European Parliament, I think, and that's also linking, say, um, parliamentary diplomacy with digital uh, diplomacy in a way. And I think that's the way forward. So perhaps a positive note on, on the awareness that I was talking about earlier and also creating the tools and the structure to use those tools. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, just a last question because uh, we are reaching uh, um, the end of the session. Um, this one from Frida, um, uh, my colleague at ISDP, and she asked, uh, Sweden, is currently as exper uh, Sweden is currently experiencing something of a national branding crisis after the, the uh, Quran was burned in public, as this has sparked a lot of uh, out outrage uh, internationally. Has this been uh, detrimental in any way to the EU's uh, broader efforts in digital diplomacy, and are there any lessons that can be learned from these, uh, from this incident? Uh, I guess maybe Shusha, you want to take this one, or yes, um, oh, yeah, it's. Uh, let me just think quickly. So, if it, in any way, what are the the lessons learned, uh, learned, well, I mean, European societies are open societies that allow a space for a divergence of views. Um, and I think this will continue. So the response is not to, to restrict the space, uh, but to allow um, that conversation to continue. So in, in this regard, um, I'm sure that um, it, I wouldn't say that it's been detrimental, uh, but it just shows that uh, digital diplomacy is an is a process that really requires the co uh, collaboration of of all stakeholders uh, in society and also to use that space uh, in a strategic way. So that's a general answer, but it's a very specific question. So um, I don't don't really have time to to go into much detail now. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can. I, I can. Uh, I can share because um, I. I think the lesson we can learn from this incident is that you know building trust is a very long process, but destroying it is just at <laughs> it's just a very simple thing. Like you can destroy it within one day. Uh, I think for Swedish government, maybe uh, they have to be clarified about their position. Like, do they support this kind of uh, behavior or are they against to it? Uh, and what are their attitude toward immigrant? They have to be clear about it. And this, this situation, maybe it's kind of similar, like this information. I mean, you, you have to produce more content. If you want to keep your position through digital diplomacy, you have to produce more content to clarify yourself. So um, in this case, I think uh, maybe... Um, maybe the Swedish government can do some statement or maybe they can, uh, or the organization, nonprofit organization in Sweden can launch some campaign like to uh, to generate some like maybe public discussion about it or to, uh, to, to clarify their position also. So I think digital diplomacy is an open space for everyone. Just it depends on uh, what kind of image you want to deliver to foreign society. And, and this is also connected with um, the concept of uh, community in my slides, like how to make immigrants feeling that you are in the same community is, is kind of crucial in this case. So uh, shaping uh, feelings or shaping the uh, community is, is very uh, important for digital diplomacy also. Thank you so much. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we have to wrap up uh, this panel, um, but uh, um, it has been a very, very insight insightful and interesting discussion today. We have so many take uh, takeaways. Uh, for example, digital diplomacy is it's invisible, but not impossible, right? And uh, it's not, uh, to me, I think it's uh, building an online uh, community is, uh, is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah, just like uh, writing a thesis. So it's a very long-term process, yeah. And, um, but today with our panelists, uh, Zhuja and Jayo's extensive uh, expertise, uh, we have learned so much from both of them, uh, from their insights and uh, thoughts on the digital diplomacy linkages between Nordic countries and Taiwan. And hopefully uh, this is just, 
just the start of a long-term discussion on the digital diplomacy linkage between um, Taiwan and Nordic countries. Um, for our viewers' information, we will have our final session of this year's Taiwan Nordic Forum on this Thursday, March 23rd. Uh, it will focus on the theme of uh, energy transition with Dr. Zhao Jiawei from Taiwan and Dr. Ignacio Herrera um, on Chustiki as the panelist and my colleague Larissa Stunkel as the moderator. Uh, the one hour session uh, will also start from 10, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Stockholm time, Central European time. Uh, please do sign up if you are free and interested. Also, we hope our viewers uh, can continue to follow our events and publication at ISDP. Um, if you, speaking of digital diplomacy, uh, if you haven't signed up our newsletters or follow our Facebook, uh, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts, uh, please do. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks to everyone who has joined us today. And uh, thank you again, Jayo and Shuja, for your wonderful presentations and sharing of your thoughts on digital diplomacy. I hope everybody has a great week ahead. And thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.